So yeah, so I thought I would um, uh, tell you about one of my favorite appearances, uh, both historically and mathematically, of, of pi. Uh, this is not a very original opinion. I think many mathematicians and uh, you know, I'll share this, but so this is so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some famous work of Euler. So this is, I think, this is in 1734 or something like this. So Euler is famous for many things, uh, but one thing he is famous for is uh, for uh, for evaluating the, uh, evaluating this infinite series. So this, uh, this is a condensed form notation for the sum of the reciprocals of all the, the squares. Four. Right. Okay, so this is this is an infinite series, which is you know, um, sorry. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so when you learn when you learn about sequences and series in a in a calculus course, you learn what expressions like this mean. Uh, you learn what it means for a uh, series to converge and what it means for a series to diverge. Uh, this is an example of a convergent series. Um, so this, so what that means again, you know, formally what that means is that if I look at all the partial sums, if I just sum up the reciprocals of some finite uh, set, that gives me a number. And as I let the finite sums go out farther to infinity, that sequence of numbers converges to the sequence of numbers. That's, and so it's not difficult uh, to see that this um, this series converges to something. In fact, it's, I'll leave it as maybe an exercise to think about if you haven't thought about this before. Um, this, whatever it sums to, is, is definitely less than two. That's so something you could try to show. Um, this is a kind of, if you haven't thought about these things in a while since taking calculus, it's worth, worth thinking about. So what's difficult here is not that this series converges, um, but what is not at all obvious is what it converges to. So there's some, so this is some number, but what number is it? And that was a, um, a question that mathematicians in the early 1700s were interested in. Uh, the Bernoulli brothers spent a long time trying to figure this out uh, without success. And uh, <clears throat> perhaps unsurprising, it's very difficult. In general, if you give me a series, a convergent series to say what it, what it comes to. Um, uh, but the answer is uh, figured out by Euler and it, it's a, it's a fantastic statement for a lot of reasons. And uh, it, but so this is what I'll explain. So the answer is uh, it's I squared on six. So the sum of the squares, is, so, so many of you have probably seen this before, but hopefully some of you have not. And if you've never seen this before, uh, I encourage you to contemplate it for a moment. Uh, where on earth does pi come from? And this, at least the first glance, this, the, this seems to have absolutely nothing to do so the, this is a, a, this theorem of Euler that shows this is, is beautiful in part because it's so striking and unexpected. Okay, so I want to explain uh, to you why this is true. And, um, and I will try to do it uh, sort of perhaps as Euler knew it. So a lot of, uh, a lot of mathematics developed since, uh, since the mid 1700s, and in particular standards of rigor, and uh, you know, if you're taking a course in analysis now, for instance, you you understand what it means to prove that things converge, and uh, and Euler uh, worked in a time before all of that rigor was kind of put on a firm basis. But nonetheless, uh, so I'll try to explain a little bit as Euler knew, and then maybe say a little bit about where uh, Euler's proof needs elaboration in the language of modern. Okay, so any questions about the, what I'm gonna to try to explain? Okay. All right, so, okay, so let's, I'll erase this and back up for a moment. <clears throat> so, um, okay, so let's start. If I can start right over here, can I see? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so let me, let me give you a little bit of a, a little reminder. Uh, on, on polynomials. So, 
let's say p is a polynomial, yeah. which I want to think of as a function of a one variable polynomial, which I want to think of as a function of a single variable. So suppose I tell you that p Um, suppose I tell you where the polynomial vanishes, where its zeros are. So suppose I tell you that, that P is zero at, at A, at B, at C, and at D. That's it. This curve. Is it e? um, and let's say I also tell you that, uh, that P of one equals one, right? Um, so I told you all the zeros and I told you the P of one equals one. Well, then I can just you look at this and write down the polynomial. I can write down what P is. Let's say if, you know, P is say degree four. So I've written all the, the zeros here, possibly with multiplicity or some of these could be the same. So then, then what is P? When, when, well, there's a way to write it. Let, let's just for simplicity, let's. Um, all right, I want to give you zero. In particular, uh, uh, none of these numbers are zero. Um, okay, so, so on the left, I have my polynomial P, and on the right, I have a polynomial which. Um, but you can just look has all of these properties, right? If I plug in x equals zero, then I get one times one times one times one. So the right hand side is the value of the one when x is zero. And this expression clearly vanishes at each of these points because when x is a, for instance, then this first term here becomes zero. So this is a, a basic fact about polynomials that, that, uh, that this is an expression for this polynomial. In other words, if I tell you the roots of the polynomial, well, I haven't quite told you the um, polynomial because I, um, I almost have one additional piece of information. <coughs> okay, so <clears throat> let's uh, keep that observation um, in the back of our minds. So now back to the Euler's theorem. So Euler knew, I mean, he knew quite a lot of calculus, and he knew that he, he was interested in functions that weren't necessarily polynomials, but one of the basic ideas of calculus is that you can try to treat functions as if they were polynomials. In particular, when you learn about Taylor series, that's one of the philosophies, is that you can approximate a function by polynomials, and that uh, many of the things that you might want to know about a function, you can study by thinking about, uh, about its Taylor series. So, for example, I mean, Euler knew that uh, how to write <clears throat> sine x as a polynomial. Well, not as a polynomial. Sine x, sine is not a polynomial. But he knew what the Taylor series for sine was. He knew to approximate this by uh, polynomials. So, This is uh, the Taylor series for sine. In particular, it's actually more, slightly more relevant for us to think not about sine, but to think about sine x over x. So at least when x is non-zero, um, you can just look at this and write it. I could factor out an x from everything here at the bottom, so I get one minus minus x to the fourth minus five factorial minus. Six over six factorial. Uh, oops, seven factorial. Six factorial. So it's an alternating, alternating sum. So this soil or new. But so, um, but so now Euler, what he thought, what he realized, he said, well, hold on. I also know. So this is a this is a function which evaluates to one when x is zero. I mean, as I've written it here, the left hand side doesn't make sense in x equals zero, but um, if you take the limit as x goes to zero of this side, you get one. So this function <coughs> is a function, I know it's value of zero is one, and I also know where the zeros of this function are. Let me, let me call this function f for a moment. So when is f zero? 
No. We know when sine is zero, right? Sine is zero at uh, integer multiples of pi. So this is, you know, like pi and minus pi, two pi and minus two pi, and three pi, minus three pi. So <clears throat> now, so Euler said to himself, yeah, well, I mean, you know, this is basically just a polynomial. If I know what its zeros are, and I know its value at zero, then I can write it down. So that's what he did. So he said, so but again, by like, if you like armed by uh, good intuition and analogy with polynomials, <clears throat> he just wrote a product expansion for, for sine x over x. So he wrote, as he said, so x. Well, pi pi plus pi, and I'll just write one more pair of terms to make it clear. So this is and then so on. So he wrote an uh, infinite product expansion for for sine x over x. And I think this is one point where uh, a, a modern mathematics student might ask, well, hold on, what, is that really true? Can you just do things like that? This is a place where I don't think he would have justified this, except to say that he would assert that this is true. And it is true. So this is um, it's absolutely right. Uh, so we, what he's done is something that uh, we do all the time with polynomials. You take polynomial expansion, you factor it. You write it as a product or you write it as a sum. And he's done that for sine x. And so now something completely magical happens, which is, uh, said, well, okay, so let's look at, we have these two expressions for the same function. So let's just equate like terms. Let's look over here and let's see what happens when, um, when we collect terms. So I'm going to expand this and, and, uh, and see what, what pops out. So for example, here, so let's, let's just expand this and see what happens. So what's the constant term here? One. Now, actually, I'm going to do it in two steps. I'm going to multiply these pair and this pair and this pair, as we can see. So if I multiply these pairs, what do I get? This is like one minus something, one plus something. So it's one minus the square. Right? So this is one minus x squared over pi squared. And then this becomes one minus x squared over four pi squared. And this becomes one minus x squared over nine pi squared. And so on. Okay, now let me, uh, so that's one. And then I'm gonna have a minus x squared. And now let me, what, what's the coefficient so what's the coefficient of x squared? Well, and, uh, and actually, let me, so let me factor out x squared over pi squared, minus x squared over pi squared, because they all, all of the, uh, so there's a pi squared there, but what's left? So here we go. One plus one fourth plus one ninth plus one that. So in other words, we have, and then, and then of course we have, so something times x fourth plus something times x sixth, whatever. But the upshot is that if we just we started with two expressions for sine x over x, a product expression, and this Taylor series expression, and if we just look at the coefficient of x squared. Um, we get something rather remarkable looking. So, so we're just looking at the coefficients of x squared. So on the right on the on the right hand side, the coefficient of x squared is minus one over three factorial. 
minus one sixth. And what do we have on the left hand side? We get one, minus one over pi squared times What's the series we've been interested in. Okay. So, so we get uh, Miller's theorem. So, um, so that's the proof, and the and the only point I think that a, a modern uh, reader might take issue with, or at least think deserves explanation, is the uh, the assertion that these, two, that these that both describe sine the function sine x over x. Um, but that's true, and uh, uh, and probably the uh, I mean, in, in, when, when given that statement, you can prove it. It's also something that you, you might come across when you study some complex analysis. It's very much you know, un modern undergraduate mathematics to, to think about those two things. Um, so there's a number of things I, I love about this proof. I mean, in particular, the answer is amazing. Pi squared, have, where, where does pi come in? Well, the proof kind of tells you where pi comes in. It tells you secretly that this series, which uh, is actually, is, there's something about trig functions hidden here. Um, and so, the, and well, and the, the proof makes this, makes this point explicit. In particular, this is, and this is something that happens a lot in mathematics. This is a statement about numbers. The left-hand side is a number and the right-hand side is some number. And we knew this left-hand side was some number. We're trying to figure out what number it was. It's very difficult to attack that without leaving the world of numbers. We have to leave the world of numbers and move to the world of functions. So this is something, you know, if I told you, if I just handed you the statement and said, prove that this equals this, I mean, I mean, the Bernoullis couldn't do that and they tried for like 20 or 30 years or something. That's, that's, that's hard. But if I told you prove that this equals this, equals sine x over x, you know, you know, calculus, that's something you might be able to do. And certainly after you, you take some analysis, that's something that, that one can do. So one part of Euler's genius here was realizing that this is really not the right equality to think about. The right equality to think about is to think about the same function in two different ways. And that's something that comes up a lot, um, a lot in mathematics. Um, and the second thing is that, uh, well, this, I think, hints at one of the things that Euler's very much one of the main contributors to, which is that the unity of various classical mathematical subjects, I mean, the, the Euler's famous formula, e to the, the pi i plus one equals zero, exactly closely related to this whole story. This unifies, on the one hand, the theory of complex numbers, on the one hand, trigonometry, and on the other hand, exponentials and logarithms. So, um, so somehow, Complex analysis is uh, is the place where all of these subjects become the same. And this, uh, and often for many people, the first time they see this kind of statement is complex. Um, yeah. So, uh, so that's basically what I wanted to tell you. I mean, this is I think for many people when they see it, both surprising and also a, a kind of amazing appearance of pi. Where's where's pi here? The only last thing I'll maybe mention is. This is not the only thing Euler did with this observation. He used the same basic idea, equating coefficients in this expression, to sum up the you know, fourth powers, or really, in principle, any even powers. Fix k. Sum of the even powers. This is. It, 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 the formula looks, sim it looks uh, similar. It's a, it's a rational multiple of pi to the 2k, something p over q and pi to the 2k. Um, so Euler knew that. Um, what Euler didn't know is what to happen and what to do if you take an odd power. Like for example, some of the reciprocals of the cubes. 
Princeton. His method didn't really allow him to get anywhere with that. Um, and it's perhaps unsurprising because we still don't know. This uh, kind of closed form for, for this is uh, still open. Uh, the context in which you might hear this alluded to is uh, this is really part of uh, the Riemann hypothesis. The Riemann hypothesis, this is the zeta function evaluated in three. Uh, there's a lot that's not known about the Riemann zeta function, a lot that is known, a lot that's not known. And uh, yeah, but, but a kind of early precursor to the Riemann hypothesis is to evaluate the series, and that's something we still don't know. Do we have any questions from the A and the audience? I'm quickly checking to see if there are any questions from the world audience. Well, there's no question. Um, you pointed to that equation um, on the top there, and you just, um, yeah, that, just like the everything yeah. brackets for that. Yeah, you just alluded to that something you'll explore further in the complex analysis. Can you just expand? Yes. So, yeah. So, so I mean, in complex analysis, so you, so when I write a function like this, if I think of this as a function, you know, you think x takes values somewhere. So usually, in in real analysis or in calculus, you think x is a real number. But in complex analysis, you think about functions of a complex variable, and um, and then you talk about what it means for a function of a complex variable to be differentiable, and that leads and and the. And the functions of a complex variable that are differentiable, that theory is much cleaner than the theory over the world. Uh, in particular, you talk about what's called a holomorphic function. And, uh, and then you basically prove theorems that say, you know, a holomorphic function is expressible as a power series. In particular, you know, this, this function is a holomorphic function. So you, you know quite a lot about it. Quite a lot about it. And, and, and it's not true that, I mean, it's not exactly true that a holomorphic function is completely determined by its zeros and poles. I mean, well, no, no, no. Yeah, a meromorphic function is not quite determined by its zeros and poles, but it almost is. And you can kind of make that precise. Well, it doesn't seem like there are any questions from the audience. So one more time, thank you to Tony. Hello, my audience of three here talking to the world. I wish I had my Hello World t-shirt on, I don't. Um, I was asked to, uh, to give a short talk, so I'm going to. Uh, thanks for having me along. Um, it's a very tenuous connection with Pi. I know it's Pi Day, it was Pi Day yesterday, Happy Pi Day. Um, this isn't my area, uh, but it is kind of fun to think about, and it's fun to think about if you're wanting to mess with your friends' heads or your family's heads, because it's about um, infinities. But what I actually, what made me um, pursue this was I was interested in this question that I saw on this math stack exchange, um, which was quite a fun, fun one. Is do the digits of pi, sec written out pi, contain all finite sequences of numbers? I don't believe the answer to this is known. Uh, does anyone know of any references? And I just loved one of the responses to it. And there was obviously some people were saying, yes, of course it is. Some people were saying, no, of course it isn't. Um, and this one uh, was a real number that is not rational does not necessarily contain all sequences. Uh, for example, looking at the first digits, it is very unlikely that pi contains this sequence, which if you count them very quickly is 26 zeros. And this is true, it is very unlikely. Um, um, but in fact, what, we'll, we'll come back to how unlikely it is and then talk about some other stuff. But um, uh, what, is, what this question is actually asking is, is pi normal and um, it's a funny definition for a, a number to be normal or not, but numbers are defined as being normal if they can contain every possible integer sequence. So pi being normal would, if we know that that is true, then this was answer the question in the positive, and then we definitely contain that string. Um, it is possible con to contain, to construct normal numbers. Um, it's very easy. You fudge it. You basically say, I will take all of the possible strings of, of digits uh, and put them into one number, which is a messy way of doing it. It's known as Champenown's constant, but it's 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 
10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Obviously, it's then going to contain every possible um, um, sequence of, of digits. So yes, so the question becomes, you know, is, is pi normal? Um, uh, yeah. Another way of making one of these normal numbers before we do is uh, this is shorter one, shorter in quotes, because it's also an infinite sequence of numbers is by Copeland Erdish. Um, and this is very clever. I haven't looked at the proof for this, but I'm quite interested in it. Um, and you can create a normal number simply by listing all the primes, which is very easy. It's also very easy to construct numbers that definitely cannot be normal. What is that noise? Okay. Um, and, um, and you could say 0 0.01, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Are we working? Oh, I just got to sleep. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be back in the moment. Here we go. Uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. You can definitely construct a number that definitely, that, um, uh, definitely doesn't contain the string 0, 0. Really easily. Okay, so maybe it's a, maybe it's a question of, um, of whether pi is normal. Oh, now it's not going to move. Well, I'm having moved. Here we go. Not too far. Is it up or is it down? That should be side to side. Side to seconds. side. Okay, right. Okay, got it. All right. So this got me thinking about infinity anyway, this question. And was it 26? It was 24 digits of zeros. We, we all know because this is. Um, very simple maths to work out what's the probability if our number, say pi, um, uh, had digits that were effectively just drawn effect normally, uniform normally, um, from a distribution of 10 digits. And then we could work out the probability that any particular non overlapping chunk might happen to match that set of zeros. It's a pretty tiny chance. So we might be a bit surprised if it did. But then again, um, You've been watching maybe some, is it three blue, one brown, or is it the other way around? Three brown, one blue, three brown, one blue, or number file videos, which I encourage you to. Um, there's one really nice one, which is infinity is a lot bigger than you think. And infinity really is a lot bigger than you think. We're talking about sort of how much worse it is, I guess, than you were, you were fearing. Um, because we can choose any of infinitely many non-overlapping 24 um, bit, uh, chunks of our sequence. And so, well, you know, the probability that none of them match if it was all um, uniform randomly uh, chosen, which of course they're not. But if it were, then of course the probability that none of them match would be zero. It's pretty easy to work that one out. So we shouldn't be surprised if somewhere in the trillionth digits of, of pi uh, sequence of 24 zeros. But it does make you think about infinity. And um, I remember, actually, I remember where I was sitting when my mum told me when I was age four that numbers just kept going on. I thought this was the coolest, weirdest thing out. Um, what happened? When does it stop? I asked, and she said, it doesn't, it just goes on forever. Mind blown. Um, and so um, we've, we've, we're aware of things like infinities. We're aware of that, uh, say, a big number uh, can always be made a little bit bigger just by adding it. Um, I've got a little uh, sort of side reference up here, um, subtle reference on, on the slides here. Sorry, I'm not using chalk. I miss chalk. Um, and this was a competition. It's taken from the idea of a competition between um, some philosophers who were trying to construct bigger and bigger numbers. And the first one just wrote out on the board, one, 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 all the way along. So I think when I would have been using chalk, um, because the next one came along and essentially ran their finger along the line from here all the way along and turned all those ones into factorial signs and made a very big number. Clearly, this is a very big number. But is it infinite? Of course not. You can always make it bigger. When does it end? So, so we talk about infinity. So infinity is, um, is not actually a number. And of course, it's not actually a single thing. There are multiple infinities. 
terms out. I'm just going to take you through some, some thoughts about infinity now, just because it's kind of fun. Um, and one way we can talk about infinity is we can talk about cardinalities of sets. We can talk about the number of objects in a set. Uh, if we can construct a set that's infinitely big, we could talk about its cardinality and say that would be, that would be infinite. So let's start with a really simple one. Let's start with such a set, uh, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, forever. Forever is a, is a long way. We're not going to list them all, but we could say that this is countable. We could write them all down. Um, the uh, number file chats like to call this, or at least what's his name? Brady. Not Brady, one of the other ones. Um, sorry, uh, likes to, dislikes the term countable, prefers the word listable, which you can understand. Listable means you can actually put them all in order. That would be really nice. If we can put them all in order, then we will say that that's countable. And um, we will say that the, 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 that list, if you like, or the set of counting numbers is a countable infinity. We'll give it a number a label, omega or aleph naught. Um, there, when we start talking about more infinities, which is coming up, um, um, maybe we would then find a use for those subscripts. So how many integers are there? We started with counting numbers. Well, how many integers are there? This is, well, surely there are twice as many, um, but um, we'll, we'll figure out how we're going to, um, how, how to count those. The way we count things that are, I had to move. All right. okay. So we can talk about um, uh, how many things there are in a set. If we know that, for example, a set whose cardinality we know has a one-to-one -one relationship with our set of interest. And so if, for example, we've got a set of counting numbers and a set of whole numbers, so it's zero, one, two, three, four, up to positive, we could make a, a an easy map that went from a counting numbers n to the whole numbers n minus one. And you can see it's one-to-one. -one. So the same, although there's one more, so we've got this, one of the sets has got zero and the other one hasn't and everything else matches, you can still use that argument to show, yes, in fact, there must be the same cardinality. It's still infinite, but it's the same cardinality because you've got this bijection, this one-to-one -one map. Okay. Well, we can do a one-to-one -one map with counting numbers and integers, even though there are twice as many because two times infinity turns out to be infinity. So, Start messing with people's. I don't know where the cursor's gone. Well, there it is. Okay, so we can uh, we can match one with zero. We can match two with one, three with minus one, four with two, five with minus two, and so on. We could match two k, an even number with k, and an odd number, two k plus one, with one minus k upon two. And I think that works all out. And we can see that this is a bijection. It goes from the counting numbers to the Integers. So there's the same number of counting numbers and integers. It's twice as many, but it's still the same number. Just now things, okay, well, what about rationals? Surely there are more rationals than um, integers or than counting numbers, which is the same. If you started by counting out all of the rationals, so one over one, two over one, three over one, and so on, and then two over, sorry, one over two, two over two, three over two, and so on. And then one over three, two over three, and so on. Well, if you were counting all the way along, you would never get back to the next row. So we won't do that. But you could do it as sort of a diagonal way. You could start in the top left-hand corner and then do the first diagonal. So I've got uh, sort of an indication as the route you might take. Clearly, this one at the very top is the first one. And then there's the second, a half. And then there's a the third one, two over one. And then there's a third one. Uh, the fourth one, one upon three, and then we follow this route. And because there is this path, it's going to go through every single integer, uh, every single rational, and that path can be used to make a bijection that's going to go between the counting numbers, which is the same as the number of integers, and the number of rationals. So it's still the same. How can we make bigger numbers? This is not satisfying. We want bigger, bigger numbers. What about reals? All right, so this is an argument put forward by Cantor, um, who was 
Um, if you don't know, it's a, it's a sad story. He was roundly abused and criticized and ridiculed for his set ideas um, and uh, spent a good part of his life uh, in and out of mental hospitals because um, he thought it was ludicrous having sets constructed this way. This argument is possibly uh, the root of some of that ridicule, but it turns out later in his life, he was uh, acknowledged as having been terribly clever and correct, um, but um, yes, damage done. It's actually a, a major, major mathematician. Anyway, so Georg, Georg Cantor came up with this argument to do with binary strings. It's really easy to see in binary strings. Um, you can apply it to uh, decimal strings as well, but we're just going to do with the binary because it's nice and simple. And so here they are. We've been listing, effectively, been, we've been listing integers. We've been listing, um, sorry, counting numbers first, then integers, positive and negatives. And we've been listing rationals. And if we can do the same for reals, then there must be the same cardinality. Well, let's have a look. So suppose we can, so, you know, very common practice in, in mathematics. We're going to suppose something is true and let's see if there's a problem. So we'll suppose that we can list all of the infinite strings of binary digits. And we can realize that there, there must be some natural way to, uh, to map um, real strings of binary digits, which may be infinite, even just if they finish with the whole you know, infinite number of zeros, um, to reals, right? So that's fine. It's just easy to illustrate with, with bits or binary digits. Suppose we can list them all. So Cantor noted that it's really easy to construct something that isn't po can't possibly be in that list. And this is this diagonal argument. So up here in, uh, on the left, I snagged that image rather than typeset my own um, from Wikipedia, there's the credit. And um, uh, you can see that the diagonals, the diagonal red digits are the opposite of the blue digits below, all right? the complement of the blue digits below. So what that means is that every ith sequence, I take the ith digit and I flip it. So that, so in that new number that I'm creating, that new sequence of bits, I'm definitely differing at that ith position from the ith sequence. So this is a new number. It can't match anything, whoops, in the list already. But my assumption was I could list everything. So my assumption must be wrong. I can't list everything. It's not countable. There must be sort of definitively more items in this list than are listable in this collection of numbers um, than there are counting numbers because I can simply label my strings one, two, three, four, if I want to, if I could do it, if I could list them this way. So we, we can't do it, can't do it. So definitely we have more reals than um, naturals and rationals. Okay. Now, as I said, we can adapt that bitwise sort of argument into um, an argument about uh, reals or real sequences of, of, of decimals. You can see um, it's, a, it's a pretty obvious sort of correlation there. Okay. Well, what's been done is that, um, or what we, what we can do is realize that given a set, we could always make a bigger set. Okay, so we've made this set uh, of strings, of bits, and we made it something that wasn't in that set. And in fact, we have a very powerful way of making bigger sets. And this could be bigger sets of something infinite um, by taking power sets. So the power sets, if you have, have, uh, have not come across them before, the power set of a set is the set of all subsets. Okay, so we might have a set, it might be one, two, three, four, it might be integers. Um, so P of A is just going to be a convenient notation for the, the, the set of all possible subsets of my set A, the power set. Now, if A is finite, then where's my cursor? It's hard to see. Okay, there we go. Then 
the size of the elements in my power set is just two to the size of my original set. Because for every element in my original set, it's either in this new set or it's either in a subset or not. I've met, got this number, cardinality of A, decisions to make, two to that power gives me the number of possible outcomes, number of possible subsets then. Now let's suppose we've got some kind of bijection. Remember, bijection is going to be useful. They'll be able to tell us that this is the same cardinality between two sets. So suppose we've got some kind of bijection that's going F, we'll call it F, that maps from A to power set of A. Suppose, obviously we're expecting this not to actually work, but let's just suppose we can. With this in mind, so we're going to define a new set as follows. I can read that off there. Um, so for each element in my original set A, I'm going to put X, put A in this new set X if and only if this bijection, um, sorry, if A is not an element of that, of the image under that bijection. A is not an element of it. So it's, it's sort of run it's a little bit of a parallel to the argument with the strings, but it's a, a, bit, um, a bit subtle. Okay, so our new set X, for every element of my set in uh, every element in my big set A, I'm going to make a new set, and A is going to be in the set X if and only if. A is not mapped by my bijection. A is not in that, sorry, A, A is not in the, in, the, uh, in the image of that bijection. So that means that the new set can't be mapped to by any element of A. It can't be mapped to by anything in A because it differs by every F of A, which is exactly the same kind of error. It's a parallel argument to the Cantor diagonal argument. Um, for every A in my big set. So, well, that means we can't have a bijection. We're, stru we're screwed up. We suppose we could, we found a contradiction. We can't have a bijection from P to A, P to PA. So the cardinality of a power set is strictly greater than the cardinality of the original set. Cool, none of that needed A to be finite. So none of that argument actually requires um, wait for it to come back, black screen. Mm. None of that actually requires our set to be finite. So we could use that. We could apply that to, oh, it was there a moment ago. There's something bigger. There we go. Oh, stay. Right. Okay. Stay. Right. Okay. So I could just throw some notation at it and see what comes out. If we are say uh, this less than, less than sign, if I can even find the cursor to put it there. There it is. Okay, there's my cursor. So less than, less than to me, strictly lower cardinality than, just for a bit of sloppy notation, apologies for that. Then we can definitely say by this sort of argument, A is strictly less than or is significantly less than um, the size of PA. But we could keep doing that. We could keep doing it again and again and again. We could have this set of the power set of the power set. We could have the set of subsets. We can keep going. We can keep going this, doing this forever, right? So this is a lot. These are numbers. These are very, very big. It's infinite. Well, you know, how many infinities are there? We've actually made an infinity of infinities, which I think is very mind-numbing and very cool. So, how many infinities are there? I mean, it's more than two, clearly. And this number of infinities, well, if I look at it, if I look, hang on, go back. If I look at the, uh, the process that I've undergone, I can turn each of those infinities now and line it up with a counting number. So I now have countably many infinities or well, my my notation before was an rlf naught or an omega that's how many infinities i've made doing that process so there's a lot there's a lot of infinities um and in fact um 
it turns out that, that and these the infinities that, whoops, which we can call the typo there, these infinities can be listed I'll at naught, I'll at one, I'll at two, I'll at three, and so on. And then it gets really weird and dark. We get down a sort of a, a rabbit hole because it turns out that there are not just, you know, a countable number of infinities, there's an uncountable number of infinities. But in order to get at those, we stop talking about the cardinalities of sets. We talk about something else entirely. And so having done that, having inflicted some weird sort of you know, extra stretches to our brains, I have to say, I'm going to stop there because I think that's that's a really interesting sort of uh, place to stop. There's an infinite rabbit hole image that I really, really wanted to, to, to find that I couldn't fit on the page. So what's all this got to do with pi? Nothing much, but it was interesting. Um, and so I should say that there are some lovely sources that I've found for getting into this stuff if you are interested. Um, I, as my declaimer said at the beginning, it's not my area. So I did some hasty, hasty running around looking at um, some wonderful notes on Math Stack Exchange and found these um, notes by uh, Pete Clark at the University of Georgia, Atlanta, and of course, number file that I mentioned before. So I think there I shall stop. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't seem to have any questions. Cool. Oh,